Yeah, g'day. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. And uh, yeah, welcome, everyone. And thank you for your time. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak today on, I guess, three things that I, I'm pretty, you know, well, I'm interested in and you know, fairly passionate about. So, you know, I sort of love cattle. I grew up on a mixed cropping beef enterprise in central Queensland. So as a kid, I spent time riding horses around the flat chasing these things. We didn't have a lot of timber, but we did have quite a few bushes. So I, I did spend a bit of time chopping bushes as a kid. And I guess um, as I sort of went into my professional career, I spent a bit of time uh, working in industry, in the beef industry, um, and then in an extension role where I worked with landholders managing this combination of uh, cattle, grass and, and trees. And I guess in the last decade, my role has really been focused on you know, how, how best to manage um, these landscapes with a focus on the um, the tree component, the timber component. So what I'll attempt to uh, cover today uh, is a broad overview of of the Queensland uh, Forest Estate. Um, I'll uh, do that in and the timber industry. I'll do that in a in a national context. context. I'll give a brief overview of the private native forest estate. Um, and I guess it's its potential to produce, to generate income for landholders. I'll attempt to, to sort of describe this link between that private native forest estate and the grazing industry. And um, every time I hit the scar bar, I bring this up. Um, I'll, I'll look at, I'll attempt to look at the impact of um, trees on, on beef production and, and look at both the positive and negative aspects of those interactions. And I guess discuss a framework for landholders and um, industry people to assess the productivity and economic aspects of, of a dual enterprise. So what I won't be covering is the merits or otherwise of the Vegetation Management Act, other than to say that you know most of um, Queensland's um, forests are, are captured under the Vegetation Management Act. And while that act uh, restricts or limits broad scale land clearing, there is opportunity um, for landholders to harvest their resource, providing they do, um, do two things. They notify the department of their intent to harvest their native forest, and they do so in accordance with the, uh, the code of practice for managing native forest. So I'm not gonna speak in any detail on the code. I could, I could spend the next half hour running through aspects of the code and still only give you an overview of it. Needless to say, um, the code we have is workable. We can harvest and silviculturally treat our forests to um, ensure productive outcomes. I guess the third thing that I, I'm not sort of gonna go into details in is the carbon farming initiative and I guess other uh, vegetation usages such as vegetation offsets, biofuel, etc. Other than to say that as, as far as I see it, um, carbon and veg offsets are just another um, timber resource that are potentially available for landholders to generate income from. And the interactions of retaining vegetation to meet those um, carbon and veg offset requirements would have a similar um, impact on the grazing enterprise to a timber production system. So there's a lot of um, foresting in Australia. So there's about 131 million hectares or 17% of the Australian land mass is mapped as forest. And what a lot of people probably don't realise is nearly 40% of that uh, national forest estate is in Queensland. And Queensland has about 40% more forest than New South Wales, uh, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania combined. But when you look at our timber production, uh, we, we're not doing all that well in Queensland. So we've got most of the, the trees, but we produce only a fraction of the wood and most of that out of our softwood um, plantations. It's not quite as bad when you look at the economic value of that, um, but still of the 2.1 billion um, soil log produced in Australia, only about 10% of that uh, is produced in Queensland. So why the discrepancy? Why uh, most of the forest and so little of the wood? Well, in reality, it comes down to the, to the types of forests we have. Basically, a lot of our forests are fairly unproductive um, rangeland um, types that don't produce or a lot of wood or don't produce commercial wood. And that's indicated by the yellow shading on this map. 
the other the other reason I think why there's little um, sawlog production in Queensland compared with other states it is related to tenure. Most of um, Queensland's forest estate um, resides with the with the with the state, as indicated by the blue shading in this map. The purple shading is the privately owned resource, and you can see that there's you know that tends to be a focus of that resource in the southeast quarter of the state. Okay, so when we look at the Queensland hardwood industry, I mean we're not talking a a, a major um, industry in on the national scale or even in terms of Queensland's GDP. I think it only sort of generates in the order of, of $200 million per annum. But the processing industry has always relied on the private resource. So this is a quite a noisy graph here. Um, what we're looking at um, in the stack columns uh, is the log volume by product sourced from the state resource, so out of state forest. The brown line is the log volume sourced from the private resource. The dark gray line is the total log volume and the dash line is the proportion of that log volume that um, is extracted from the private resource. So Queensland produce uh, processes somewhere in the order of sort of 250 to 350,000 cubic meters per annum. And around 60% of that is from the private resource. So the industry, has traditionally relied on the private resource. The other thing you need to bear in mind that in 2024, most of the southeast Queensland um, forest agreement area, the state resource will close to industry. And uh, by 2034, pretty much all of the, um, the Western hardwood will be closed as well. So within 10 or 15 years, if there is to be a hardwood industry in Queensland, most of that wood will be coming off the, um, the private resource. So we just have a bit of a snapshot at the resource. As I said, most of it's sequestered in the southeast quarter of the state. So we draw a line from roughly Rockhampton out to the Carnarvons, back in towards Miles and south to the border. We know that there's about uh, 2 million hectares of privately owned native forest across a range of forest types. Now of that, about 66% is um, remnant forest. Um, and a third, about 33%, is, is regrowth. So this resource produces high quality wood. Our hardwood is second to none worldwide. I mean, it's, it's a, such a, a great resource. It's strong, it's durable, uh, and it, it has, has plenty of feature. The forest itself is, tends to be you know, multiple species and multi-aged. So there's a range of products a range of species that can be extracted at harvest and there's a, there's multiple ages so there's there's more than one chop at this cherry through time yeah you know, compared with those southern states um, these forests are of moderate to low productivity they don't produce a lot of soil log um, per, per annum unfortunately uh, most of the resource over the last probably 60 to 100 years hasn't been all that that well managed or if it's been managed at all, it's been poorly managed. But despite that, this resource is very, very resilient and it does uh, generate a lot of natural regeneration. We don't have to worry about planting trees in, in Queensland, we get sufficient natural regeneration. And we know this resource um, will respond to silvicultural treatments. And in some of our um, permanent growth uh, sites, you know, we're getting up to a five-fold increase in, in soil log productivity through time. Unfortunately, most of our private native resource has tended to be logged in a, a form of extraction we refer to as high grading, and it, it's basically a form of forest abuse. So what landowners have tended to do is they will engage a harvesting contractor or a sawmill. That contractor will uh, come into the stand and just chase the, the best trees in the stand. Won't do anything about the defective trees in the stand. Um, certainly won't take any care about how those trees are removed. So there's sort of not a lot of effort put into directional falling those trees away from, from region. You know, often there's not a lot of effort you know, put into ensuring you know, harvest residue doesn't negatively impact on that region as well. And so as a result, these stands tend to be in a, in a downward spiral in terms of productivity, and the harvest interval tends to extend out beyond 
you know, 25 to 30 years. And unfortunately, this is the industry norm. Now, what we, we do as, a, as an organisation is try to engage landholders to, to put some effort into um, appropriate harvest and silvicultural management of their forests. And so we, we conduct a, a, a four day um, workshop series spread over a couple of weeks and at least a good half of, of a day is spent in the, in, in the, the um, how, how to go about silviculturally managing these stands. So I'm going to sum that up, sum this up in about in this one slide. The fundamentals of um, forestry silviculture is to keep good quality trees. And the, the most critical um, thing we look at when we're deciding whether to keep a tree or take a tree is crown health. There is a direct positive correlation between crown health and tree growth. Healthy crowns grow wood. The other aspects we need to look at is, is log form and freedom from defect. And it's not just about removing trees that, that have a product in them, it's about removing trees that will never have a product but will impact on a good tree from attaining a product. So the other, the other aspect is to, to put some effort into removing suppressed, defective or non-commercial trees. So trees need, need room to grow. If, if we want to grow big trees, we need to give them space. So that's basically the, the fundamentals of, of silviculture. Only take trees out when they've reached their optimum value. So as an example, this is a landholder that's been a long, you know, he's about the third generation that's made money out of timber off this, this property. This is the sort of tree he leaves. He knows that that tree has probably got, you know, 1.5 to 2 cubic metres of saw log at $120 a cubic metre. But he knows that in another three or four centimetres DBH growth on that tree, as little as a couple of years, the, that tree goes from being a saw log to a girder goes from $120 a cubic metre to you know, $250 to $300 a cubic metre. So unfortunately, most of our state looks like this. So this is a remnant forest, uh, spotted gum forest near Nanango. It's mapped as remnant, but it's not old growth. There's no old, big old habitat trees within this stand. It, it was a stand that would have been cleared, wrung out during the 1920s and 30s. So. We, it's typically overstocked with in excess of a thousand stems per hectare. Individual trees within this, this stand are probably only you know, growing at a couple of millimetres per year diameter increment. And we've got very low commercial volume increments, you know, less than 0.2 of a cubic metre per hectare per year. But we do know that these stands res respond to thinning. So what we did at this site, there was a harvest you know, being conducted at the time we became involved. We the trees to keep and then we removed either extracting as a saw log or a pole trees that that could be extracted as a product and then fell to waste those trees that had no product in them and we reduced that stocking to about 150 stems per hectare now when we show this slide at our workshop series you often hear the gasp from the audience saying are you for real you did what to that stand not only you know, can we do this in, in under the, the current code of practice? This is what we would encourage landholders to do. Because while that may look like a mess at, at the point of, of um, the harvest and thinning operation, the whole point is to come back in a few years and to look at a, a stand that is now restructured on its way to being a functioning forest. So the first thing that we often see when we open up these stands is a crown response. Those retained trees, uh, their, their crowns um, recover sufficiently and that drives tree growth. So going from, you know, one or two millimetres per year diameter increment, we, we're getting increments greater than one centimetre, one centimetre per year and volume increments in excess of one and a half cubic metres per hectare per year. But the other thing that we notice invariably when we open these stands up is we get good ground cover. Now that's important if you're trying to prevent sediment moving off these landscapes into waterways, estuaries and, and the reef lagoon. It's also important if you know you want to generate some income between harvest from a grazing enterprise, you're certainly going to run more animals in this, this forest than what you would if you hadn't treated it. 
So we know that these forests respond to treatment. This is one of our permanent growth plots near ESC, and this is the stocking across our 12 um, control plots there. So our controls have stocking in the order of 500 to 600 stems per hectare. Uh, now that's the stock, that's the trees greater than 10 centimetres in diameter. If you add the trees that are less than 10 centimetres, it's probably 12 to 1500 stems per hectare. So we, we go in, we thin that out, we drop that stock into between 100 and 200 stems per hectare. And this is the growth response we get. Individual trees within those control plots are growing at you know, a couple of millimetres per year diameter increment. Individual trees within our um, thin plots are growing at somewhere between eight and, and 15 millimetres per year. So a significant increase. We know that thinning these stands results in improved timber production. So the way I see it when I when I sort of drive around and walk around the bush, there's sort of, there's three broad private and native forest situations. There's an advanced growth, regrowth um, remnant stand. So, you know, they, they may be mapped as, as remnant, but in reality, a lot of them are regrowth. And they're usually mapped as, as category B. We get young regrowth stands following sort of heavy clearing or, or harvesting operations. Now that can be either category X if it's locked in with PMAP, or if it wasn't locked in with PMAP prior to 2018, it's often now mapped as high value regrowth or reef regrowth. And the third scenario is where we get regrowth and crunching, encroaching, sorry, onto category X non-remnant country. So I've already ex explained, you know, the, the advanced growth remnant stands. This is a, uh, a regrowth stand in a black butt forest um, near Toowoomba that we manage. And this is um, a heavy regeneration following um, basically a, a clear fall operation. And so we've been in, we marked the trees we, we wanted to retain. We then went in with a mechanical harvester, removed those trees that, that needed to come out and sold them on to the um, masonite factory at, at Ipswich at the time. So 10 years later, we've got a black butt stand there that's on its way to a functioning forest. Uh, just this year, we've been back into this stand and um, done a light thinning harvest where we extracted four or 500 uh, poles and um, a couple hundred cubic metres of soil log. The third situation is this regrowth into to, um, category X. So this is a property we manage here near Jinjin. It's a mix of remnant, as you can see up on the, the um, the mountain in the background, um, there's sort of wide spaced advanced regrowth as category X in behind the creek, you can't really see it. And then we get these broad open blue gum hollows. So the old bloke who owned this property during the 1960s to the um, early 2000s spent a lot of time killing trees. But he, he, and, he and he killed trees for, to grow grass, obviously, but he didn't kill all the trees. And he did leave some very good quality um, stems to grow on. So we did an assessment here in 2011, and then by 2018, we've had a significant regeneration response in, on this, this flat. We didn't plant these trees. All we had to do there was to, uh, we, we destocked it um, for about 12 months, I was out for a few years, and just allowed that lignotuber response, those suckers to lift up out of that, out of that um, sort of from that grass competition into a, an advanced sapling, and we've been in and thinned that out. So that, that's well and truly on its way to producing good quality saw log and poles going into the future. And just as a, as a quick aside, this is a cane paddock just around the corner from where I live. So it was a cane paddock from the 1970s through to about 2016. It was left fallow uh, for a couple of years. This photo was taken in 2019. There's some blue guns, you know, behind where I took the photo on the opposite side of the road and obviously threw seed onto that, that um, cane paddock. Well, that stand now, two years later, is almost at the stage you could go in and if you wanted to grow trees, you could go and start sorting that region out. So I just threw those couple of slides into the highlight, just how resilient um, our, our forests are and the great potential we have for capturing some of this regrowth to um, provide um, economic revenue going into the future.
So this is some of Torah and Venn's, uh, Dr. Torah and Venn's uh, work, where he looked at the economic um, impacts of, of investment in silver culture. There's a bit going on. Basically, what we're looking at here, um, the brown columns uh, indicate the net present value of those stands at various um, discount rates from between 5 and 10% across a range of, of forest types. And so silvicultural treatment, just in the timber production perspective, um, pays for most of these forest types up to discount rates of about 7.5%. So it pays to treat these stands. You grow better wood um, that generates better income. And the reason why that's important is because if we took half of that, that estate and silvicultural thinned half of that, we would lift our annual um, hard look hardwood um, production from around 150 to 200,000 cubic metres per year up to 600,000 cubic metres per year. So it's a, it's a resource that's got considerable potential. So what are the impediments? Why aren't landholders investing in their silvicultural treatment of their forests? Why is only about an estimated 5% of the, the estate being treated when we need, you know, 25 at least to be, to be treated? Well, most of the resource is, is owned by graziers. Most of the private native forest resource is on land that's used for grazing. It might be a patch of timber up the back of, of the block somewhere. Um, and it's, it's owned by people that, that see themselves as graziers, not foresters. It generates, um, and it's on landscapes that graziers tend to focus on their income from their cattle enterprises. So you certainly want to chase that annual income as opposed to regular income from um, harvest 15 to 20 years apart. Graziers will often discount future earnings, so they tend to avoid investments with long payback periods. But in, one of the main reasons that I see of why we don't see and we haven't seen investment over the last 20 years is this idea of harvest security, sovereign risk. Graziers just do not trust governments not to change the rules. And I have, I have uh, friends and neighbours who are third generation um, graziers who've made a lot of money out of retaining trees on their properties to grow saw logs. Uh, and they, they're just not willing to take the risk on leaving regrowth on their category X link, even though it's locked in with a PMAP. So they're still willing to go in and clear that, that regrowth now rather than allowing it to grow into a, into a saw log product. But I think the, the real reason why we don't see investment is just a lack of understanding. Graziers don't understand forest products and their, their values. They probably have a limited understanding of forest productivity and the potential for those, those forests to, to generate income and aren't all that familiar with the um, silver cultural management regimes that can and should be implemented to optimise timber production. So that then brings us back to, you know, making the link with the grazing industry. Well, Queensland's a pretty big state and there's a lot of trees and 65% of Queensland is used for extensive beef production. As I said, there's 50 million hectares of remnant forest. If you add in some of the other um, woodlands or, you know, vegetation types that aren't technically forest, it's probably closer to about 90 million hectares. So the long and short of it is, for most, most beef producers in Queensland, managing their land and businesses means managing the mix of cattle, grass and trees. All right, so what are some of the, the impacts of trees on grass? Well, there's definitely some positive um, impacts of trees. Trees um, impact on nutrient and hydrological cycles. Uh, there's often a different suite of grasses will grow in association with trees than grow out on, on the open. Trees provide you know, shade and shelter uh, for, for grazing animals. There's obviously ecological benefits of trees in the landscape, you know, providing habitat for various native animals. And some of Greg McCann's work sort of has shown that at low tree, tree densities at least, trees may even enhance cattle production. But unfortunately, uh, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And once tree density increases, we start to see a decrease in grass production. So tree basal area is just a measurement of tree density. And you can see that as tree basal area increases, 
uh, along the x axis, we get a decrease in grass production. Now, it's not uniform, it does depend on where you are and the land type you, you have. Generally, in uh, more productive, higher rainfall land types, the re response is more linear. Once we get into duplex soils and dry environments, the response is much more curve linear. So these relationships are, are pretty well understood and, in, and are embedded in the grass model. Okay, so when we look at silvo, silvo pastoralism, it can be a bit tricky because what we're looking at um, is um, a, a value product in, in trees that changes as the tree grows. So not only does, as the tree grows, not only does it get bigger and the volume increases, uh, but the, the product specifications change. So it can change from you know, a pile to a pole, to a saw log, to a girder just as that, that tree ages. And hence you, you get a change, sometimes up, sometimes down, in terms of, of um, value. You also need to be able to track changes in tree density over time, and that can be a bit, bit tricky. So if you go in and, and thin these stands out to grow better trees, you reduce tree density, and you have a positive impact on grass production. Conversely, if you're encouraging regrowth out into this, this open country, uh, tree density will increase and you get a reduction in carrying capacity. And the, the tricky bit is, is assessing the economics of two enterprises that generate income at um, you know, vastly different time scale. So I know we're sort of running close on time here, but I just want to have a look at three scenarios as an option to manage a, a bit of um, native forest. Let's just say this is category X, so we're not impacted by the veg and this Three scenarios you can do here. You can do as the industry's done for a long time, basically high grading, log it and flog it. We're just going to come in and take out the best trees that we can, regardless of whether they've stopped growing. We're not going to worry about the damage that tree does to the surrounding young region, and we're not going to uh, invest any effort or money in thinning out the rubbish. Alternatively, we can go in with a couple of dozers and just flatten the lot to grow grass. Or well, thirdly, we might look at some appropriate silviculture to optimise tree growth into the future. So we may or may not take this tree out, depending on you know, whether it's still growing or not. We're certainly going to take out some poorer quality stems, uh, you know, and we're not going to get a lot of money for them, but we're willing to put the effort in to remove them. And then we're going to, to invest in treating out you know, the, the remainder to open up the few good trees that are in that stand. So if we track basal area change through time, obviously as we harvest and thin, we get a significant reduction in basal area. But as we move forward in time, our basal area increases. And that increases due to two things. One is we get a bit of recruitment back into the stand. But the main, the main reason we get this increase in basal area is the retained tr trees grow up to the point of the next harvest. And so we get this sawtooth pattern um, harvest intervals followed by um, inter-harvest growth. Now we don't remove a lot of trees in our um, high graded scenario, but they are big trees. So we take out few trees, but big trees, and we will get a reduction in our basal area. But it's never as severe as what it is when we then go in and remove a lot of the um, unproductive components of the stand. Obviously when we clear for grazing, we reduce our basal area to, to zero. But if we don't do anything about the um, regrowth that invariably comes back in these eucalypt um, woodlands and forests, uh, we, we will need to re-clear on, on a regular basis. So if we look at uh, commercial volume growth, um, between harvests we get um, improved growth of our retained stem trees. And, and the slope of this, these lines indicates the, the growth um, increments of individual trees. And that relates to commercial volume. So there's two things to, to, I guess, look at here. One is you get more bites of the cherry when you um, manage a stand. And that's because you're growing better trees more rapidly. So you get more high value at a more regular uh, interval than if you do nothing. So you actually start to get, you get an upward trend of your, um, your, your value in your stand with silvicultural treatment. Whereas in the high grading scenario, you, you get at this downward trend. 
So you're starting to mine your resource. Okay, so getting back to the, the business of, of growing grass for cattle, we want land to go into their native forest and open them up to grow better wood. Doing that, we will also grow more grass. So we can go to a pasture growth curve from our grass model. And if we know where we are in terms of basal area, then we can start to make an, uh, an estimate on how much grass we're growing and then how many animals we can carry. So the basic fundamentals of um, safe carrying capacity, or how we determine safe carrying capacity, and this, this underpins, you know, grazing land management, stock take. I think um, even on the um, Long Paddock website, there's a tool there now that generates this information um, for, for a block. So if we look at our overstock spotted gum stand, on average growing about 500 kilo to the hectare, not a lot of grass. We apply a safe utilisation rate, uh, meaning we've got about 125 kilos of available feed. How much feed do we need to feed an adult equivalent for a year? Well, I just work on 10 kilos for, a, for, an, for an adult equivalent. So there's three and a half tonne. So we need about 30 hectares of this forest type to feed one animal for a year. And we go in and we open it up and we reduce our, our basal area to five square metres per hectare. We look at our graph and, and we can see that our grass production you know, increases significantly. We still apply that 25% utilisation rate and we still need to find three and a half tonne to feed an animal. Just we need less hectares to feed that animal. So our cow capacity is, has increased significantly from a beast to 30 odd hectares to a beast to six. Now, obviously the whole purpose of retaining these trees is to um, grow some wood into the future. So these trees will grow, we'll get a bit of recruitment. So our basal area will increase. So when it's ready for the harvest in you know, year 15 or 20, the basal area is impacting grass production to the point that we're only getting a thousand kg to the hectare. So our current capacity um, has, has decreased down to a beast to 15 hectares. But it's still better than if we'd done nothing. And uh, I guess we, we're really focusing on the improvement in the, the wood value. So we can map carrying capacity through time for those three scenarios. We can apply some uh, production parameters. So this land type, for example, might put on between 120 and 140 kilograms of low weight gain per year. Uh, you can put a value on that. Um, you certainly wouldn't mean buying cattle at the last bigger than sale for three bucks a kilo, I can tell you that. But anyway, I use three bucks and we, we took off um, some production costs. And so you can then have a look at how, you, how your gross margin uh, varies um, with changing in, tree, change in tree density. So our, you know, cleared for grazing, you know, our gross margin, depending on where we're at in the, the regrowth cycle, will range between about 30 and, you know, $70 per hectare per year. Uh, in our unmanaged stand, it's sort of struggling to sort of go between 10 and $20 per hectare per year. And in our managed stand, we're uh, we're sort of getting you know annual returns of between twenty and and fifty five dollars per hectare per year. So what you find are these cash injections when you harvest. You need to put some significant coin into handling the regrowth, clearing or thinning, and then you get this. It just ticks over in the interim. You're getting between your your ten and you know. $60 per hectare per year to the next cash injection. And so when you just tally all that up over 100 years, I mean, it's pretty crude and pretty crass, but you're, you're getting, you know, a lot more, you're generating more income from your combined timber and grazing scenario than grazing only. Now, of course, a lot of grazers are sort of shaking their heads and the economists are having kittens right now because 100 years is a very long time. And you need to take into account the um, time cost of money. So this is some of Tyrone Venn's work again. It's a similar scenario to what we just looked at. Uh, we're just looking at the economic um, response over a 30 year cycle. And we're using a 5% discount rate. So yeah, once again, if we go and clear those landscapes, we will make more money um, per, you know, from, from our grazing enterprise than if we did nothing. And we'll make more money out of our grazing enterprise if than we would out of our combined grazing and timber enterprise. But the key difference is the 
value of the timber we generate will grow and harvest um, more than compensates for the, the loss in grazing revenue. So look, there's, I've got no doubt there's limitations and assumptions with all of this. We're not considering land value um, or capital invested in, in the land or livestock. Not accounting for changes in land condition. Um, and this, this is a bit of a risk. I mean, if you're retaining trees in the landscape and it drives down safe carrying capacity and you don't adjust your stocking rate to meet that reduction in safe carrying capacity, then you run the risk of driving land condition down. We're not accounting for the difficulties uh, in managing livestock, you know, in particular adjusting stock numbers to match a change in carrying capacity. You know, you don't just halve the stock, safe stocking rate in a paddock without having some impacts on, on herd structure. The other limitation, of course, is we've got some limited forest growth models, uh, but we are working on that. We are expanding our, our permanent growth data to um, look at some of these other forest types. And we're not look, looking at the, the what we're accounting for, the changes in the relative value of grazing and timber. And of course, we need to consider the risks. And there's there's climatic risk and there's sovereign risk. Climatic risk, it might die in a drought or flood or, or bushfire. And you know, if you wait 15, 20, 30 years to cash in your, your investment, you know, there's there's always that harvest security that, that needs to be considered. So in conclusion, Queensland has a lot of forest, just most of it's fairly unproductive and tied up in leasehold land, so it's not really available for landholders to, to utilise. In the southeast quarter of the state, the hardwood timber industry, while small on a global, uh, oh, sorry, on a national scale, um, does, depart, does depend largely on the private native forest estate, and that reliance will only increase within the next sort of 10 to 15 years. We know that the private native forest estate has considerable productive potential, and that's despite a history of poor management and a lack of silver cultural investment through time. The main impediments that I see of why landholders don't invest in their private native forest resource uh, includes that one of sovereign risk or harvest security, but more importantly, I think just a general lack of understanding or even interest in forestry. And I guess just the long-term nature of, of forestry investment is, is um, a reason why landholders are reluctant to invest in, in, in their native forest. But in many situations, you know, timber and grazing can combine to provide alternative income streams. 